So this is just going to be hopefully a quick introduction to the idea of um, expression or abundance estimation. And we've kind of already started thinking about this idea, right? So we were looking at IGV at a view very much like this, looking at a single gene locus um, and starting to ask questions like, does this gene seem to be differentially expressed? So you might argue that like this view is showing some evidence for downregulation of this sample in the bottom track or upregulation of the sample in the top track, depending on your point of view, because there's just like, even though like superficially, it looks like sort of similar amounts of read alignments in the view, you know that if you, we, we had our scroll bar here, right? Like based on these coverage levels, there's a lot more alignments up here than there is down here. And I think that the coverage level has been set at the same scale up here, like we did manually, right? So there's just a whole lot more data, more alignments, which represents more fragments of DNA, which represents more originating RNA molecules from our sample. So that suggests a difference in expression levels between these samples. It's also in this case, suggestive of some end bias, right? So you're seeing a lot more alignments here at the three prime end relative to the five prime end. What do you think that tells us about the preparation of this library? Degradation of the five prime end, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, it was probably poly A selected. So it's like a combination of those two ideas, right? You've got poly A selection of a degraded product. So you capture a lot more of the three prime ends than the five prime end. Yeah. Okay. So you've probably heard of uh, RPKM or FPKM. This is one of the com most common summary statistics. I think it was introduced in the first RNA-seq paper ever, like the Barbara Wold paper, whenever that was. Um, it's basically the idea of counting reads, so counting alignments to transcripts or genes, but then normalizing for the size of the transcript and the depth of the library. So right from the first time anyone sequenced RNA and then sequenced another RNA and wanted to compare them and compare the relative amounts of alignments to a gene for one sample versus the other, they thought, well, wait, what if these were sequenced to different levels? Or what if I want to compare the relative amount of alignments to gene A with gene B, but gene B is like, I don't know, 10 times as big. So it just generates a lot more fragments that can be sequenced when you fragment that. Uh, RNA. So almost immediately people realized, okay, we need to normalize for these ideas. We started with RPKM just because we originally were doing single end sequencing. We were generating like one read per fragment, but then at some point we started doing paired end sequencing. So you were getting two reads per fragment. Um, so we just changed the terminology to count fragments. So you, you're essentially not counting both reads of a read pair when you're calculating your FPKM. You're just using those two reads as evidence of one fragment. So that's just kind of a logical distinction between RPKM and FPKM, but effectively they're the same idea. So what is FPKM? We kind of talked about this. Why not just count the reads? Because the relative expression, while it's, it's proportional to the number of cDNA fragments, but it's biased towards larger genes or um, to samples with greater total sequencing depth. So we want to normalize for that. So what you typically do is normalize per kilobase of transcript. So that's where the K comes from and per million mapped reads in your library. And that's where the M comes from. So as we said, FPCAM attempts to normalize for gene size and library depth. RPCAM is basically the same thing. Uh, this is an example of the formula. So you're taking the C as the total number of mappable fragments for a gene or transcript, N as the total number of mappable fragments in the library, L as the number of bases in the gene, so the size of the gene, and then FBCAM is just C divided by N times L times a thousand times a million. There's like a bunch of different ways you can express this that all mathematically equate to the same thing. 
So you can read more about that in these Biostars postings. TPM has become equally, if not more popular than FPCAM. It is just a slight variation of this idea. So you're still normalizing for gene size. You're still normalizing for library size. You're doing almost exactly the same thing. There's like a slight tweak in the order of operations. So with FPCAM, you determine the total fragment count and divide by a million, then divide each gene fragment count by number one, and then divide that fragment per million by the length of each gene or transcript in kilobases. In TPM, you divide each gene um, fragment count by the length of the transcript, so you get fragments per kilobase. You sum all the fragment per kilobase values for the sample and then divide by a million, and then divide one by two. So the details here are not terribly important. There's a slightly different order of operation. You end up with values that are very, very similar, but there's this one um, nice property, which is that the sum of all the TPMs in a sample are always the same. So it makes it easier to compare the values between samples because, um, and also between genes in a sample and across samples, because there's sort of like a fixed denominator. Whereas in with the FPCAM method, you can end up with like, more total FPCAMs. If you add them all up, you get like a larger total in one sample versus another sample. Um, and depending on how you think about it, that could be sort of correct. Like there's maybe there's just more total expression in that sample than another sample. But for the most part, we're happier to make the assumption that like the total expression is kind of the same. And what we're more interested in are like, what are the relative changes in expression of certain genes or pathways. Um, so TPM, like, I guess is mathematically just slightly more convenient. I think at one point we produced a plot that you'll see later of the FPCAM versus TPM. And at least in our data, it's like extremely tight, like extremely highly correlated. This is like, it's a pretty subtle difference. Um, but I think generally at TPM is just like considered more favorable. So we are going to use software called StringTie, um, much like with HiSat. Um, this is a very complicated and detailed algorithm um, for which you could probably take not only like a whole lecture or workshop, but probably a whole university course on or multiple university courses, actually, <laughs> to learn the underlying mathematics and theory. So we are not going to cover it at that level, but we're going to look at it at a very high conceptual level. So the way it works is um, you take your read alignments, um, you can optionally uh, create kind of super reads or merge the reads together into longer reads or longer alignments. And then um, you create what's called a splice graph and extract the heaviest path from that splice graph, construct a flow network, compute the maximum um, flow through that flow network to estimate the abundance for each isoform, and then iteratively update the splice graph by removing the reads that were assigned by the flow algorithm in the previous calculation of maximum flow. And that process kind of repeated until there's no reads left. And we'll look at an example of what that kind of looks like. But essentially you're like thinking about the connections between exons, right? So this is all about how do I estimate the expression level of different isoforms. If you're just trying to estimate the level overall of genes, it's fairly easy, right? Because you have a gene locus, you figure out all the reads that map to that gene locus in one isoform or another, and you come up with like an, a TPM or FPKM style measure. That's like by comparison, very straightforward. When you want to estimate the expression level of individual isoforms, it becomes much more complicated, right? Because now you're trying to figure out for all these read alignments, some reads map to exons that are shared between transcripts. Some reads map to splice junctions like exon exon junctions that are shared by only maybe a subset or only one isoform. And you kind of like have to reverse engineer like what's the possible explanation for this pattern of alignments that I see and how can I from that extract like the, the isoform by isoform expression levels. It turns out that like is a very hard problem and probably the short paired end reads while they're good are 
not everything that we would wish to really do it properly or the best job that we could. So, and the other problem is like your results will vary a lot depending on the complexity of the locus. So how many different isoforms are we talking about? And the expression level, because that affects how much sampling of that locus you get. So if you have like a gene that's pretty simple, like it's got two isoforms and one has um, like an exon skipping event and the other one doesn't, then maybe it's like relatively straightforward to like look for the reads that define you know, this exon skip event and assign expression levels to those two isoforms. And if you have like good expression of both of them or good expression from that gene locus, maybe it's like relatively straightforward to come up with an accurate estimate of those two isoforms. But in a lot of species like human, you have like sometimes five or 10 or 20 or 50 different isoforms with all like subtle little differences between them. And then maybe that gene is only modestly expressed. So you have kind of like spotty RNA-seq alignment coverage across this locus. And just because of insufficient sampling, you haven't seen some of the exon-exon junctions that define certain unique isoforms. And so from that, you conclude what? That the isoform isn't there. You assign a level of zero to it. it you know, it just, it gets like really challenging really quickly. And the short reads, the relatively short reads that we're using, a lot of times they're still ambiguous. Like they don't, they're not long enough to distinguish between all the possible isoforms. So what we really want is like full length transcript level sequencing, right? And I think Malachi alluded to this briefly that like we're getting much closer to where that will be a reality that like you will take your, your mRNA, produce full length cDNA, and feed it through like a nanopore or a pack bio and just fully sequence the isoforms. And there will be none of this like craziness that we're going to kind of review here because it'll just be like a pretty simple exercise of saying, yep, this is the full length of this transcript. It matches this isoform that I know about, or maybe it's a novel isoform and I can estimate the expression of it pretty straightforward. The, really the only thing that's holding us back is the cost of the throughput you need in the nanopore or pack bio. Like you still need lots of counts, right? You still need lots of reads, whether they're long or short, to come up with a good expression estimation. So as soon as we can like feed a large amount of data through the nanopore at like an effective cost, like something that's like three or $400, this approach will probably go away and we will like just be doing long read uh, RNA-seq. But we're not there yet. So for now, um, we're depending on the incredibly smart people to develop software like this, to like do the crazy backflips to try to infer what's happening at an individual transcript level. So what they're doing is creating a flow network associated with each transcript. So we've got a very simple example here, transcript with um, three exons, exons uh, one, three, and five in orange, green, and red. Uh, they create um, this uh, flow network represented by these colored nodes. There are, in this case, 15 fragments. So each of these gray bars represents one of the um, fragments that have been aligned to this um, cartoon gene locus. And then you make connections between the nodes of the flow network um, based on the alignment. So if an alignment starts in exon 1 and ends in exon 3, you add that as a connection between exon one and exon three and so on. Um, you can similarly connect exon one to five or exon uh, three to five. So you kind of map these values onto these um, nodes of this flow network. And then you figure out what is the, the heaviest path through this graph. In this case, it's fairly obviously this path, right? There's a lot more counts along here than there is along here. And so um, using that, you calculate um, using flow theory and a, ma a maximum uh, flow through that uh, flow network. From that, you assign an estimated abundance. You then remove the reads that contributed to that particular path through the graph, and you repeat the process with other paths through the graph until you've like extracted all the possible paths. So you're kind of using 
um, a number of different um, areas of math, I guess. So using like graph theory and um, flow theory and some optimization theory and some heuristics to estimate abundance levels through this through this graph. And this conceptually maps onto like the exon exon junction connections that you're getting from your alignments. So yeah, just to summarize, uh, string ties using basic graph theory, splice graph, heuristics, heaviest graph path, um, more graph theory, which is a flow network, optimization theory to do the maximum flow. Uh, and if you want to read all about this, there is a very good and detailed string tie paper for the definitions and, and math that's underlying that. It works relatively well. Um, one thing that you may come across is the desire to merge together um, gene structures. So because we're doing this like sophisticated string tie approach, we can not only estimate the expression level of um, known isoforms, but we can also infer novel isoforms. So a complexity of that is that you can run string tie on one sample in a certain mode and come up with like a list of transcript identities, like both known and new, and they can run it on another sample and come up with a different set of isoforms, known and new. And then you have the problem, well, how do I compare the abundance levels between these things? They might not even have the same transcripts discovered from them, right? So you can do this string time merge to create like a common set of transcripts that have been discovered and then rerun the expression estimation on that common set of transcripts. We are going to mostly be just doing the so-called reference only mode. So really just estimating the expression levels of known genes and transcripts. But we provide like a whole section on how to run it with reference guided or de novo modes if what you really want to do is discover novel isoforms. You can also use this tool to do a compare. So again, if you are inferring transcript structures from your RNA-seq data on different samples and you want to ask how they compare, um, there's a tool to help you do that called GFF Compare. 